pray and then we'll be good. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful weather that you've given us. Yes. Lord, we thank you so much for it. Um, Father, as we're continuing on this, we just we praise you because you are a good and gracious God. And, and we get to know that we can have security in you because you have done all the work. And we just, we're just recipients. And so, Lord, we thank you. And so as we're going through this information, Lord, help us not to get bogged down with information and thereby get puffed up, but rather mm -hmm. help us to to utilize it as, as tools, as um, things that we could use later on when you bring us into conversation with people. And so, Lord, we just ask to be used by you so that we can reach people, and that's what we desire. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time, and we, we give it over to you. So it's in your son's name we pray, amen. 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 All right. Jeremiah. So, yes. Could we go back to number five? Uh, sure. I don't know what number five is. So. On page 81. What's number five? <laughs> All right. If we're talking Hebrews 1 and 3, we'll be in the brightness of his glory. The, the express. The express. Uh, yeah, we've okay. We've all got a blank for this Greek character here. Yeah, it's, yeah, so I have to actually see it. Um, because I I figured it out this week and I didn't fix it either. So, I have a little terabyte thing that's like this. And that's what I do all my updates on. And I figured this out because I was with the teenagers. And I'm like, it doesn't have the information. Where's the information? And I finally found it. It was because it wasn't on this computer. It was on my terabyte. And so that's why this doesn't match. I realized that. So we're on page 81. Right? Yeah. Okay. Why do you express a Greek character? Um, Meaning a blank for blank to make a carbon copy. Is that a prototype in there someplace? So we're on five. Yeah. Right at the very end. Of yeah. Five. So a Greek character. So this is mean. Um, so it's carbon copy. Um, yeah. Mean, it says meaning a blank or blank. To okay. Blank. So it's meaning a stamp. Okay. So um, a stamp. Yeah. That's kind of what they said in the. Stamp. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To make like it's it's coins is what they make them for, and then stamp for what coins to stamp make a, a photocopy yeah. coin. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Now. Yeah. Remember you're talking about that coin. So. Yeah. So I found the. So what I was saying is, so I found it, and then I lost it. Again. <laughs> Never mind. I found it. <laughs> So this is it. This has all my stuff on it, and now, but I don't. Now I don't know where the plugin is. Oh, maybe this is this. Okay, I found it. All right. Electronics are so great as long as they work all okay. Yeah. Plus <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I have things on that computer. I have things on my desktop. I have things on this. I have things everywhere. I know the feeling. You're very organized. I'm very organized. <laughs> if I knew where everything was. Down there, you trying to find something about 25 minutes. Who's trying to get a chair? Not for the big one. Right. Just a period of time. You have to see me in the back. I was digging around computers because I thought I lost 20 years worth of research on family history. And I couldn't get on one of my old computers and I finally got on it and there it was. They, these things are great. If you have it. If you don't, know, lose your data. You're yeah. supposed to put everything onto the cloud now and that way you know kind no. of where it is. No, 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 no. I do not trust the cloud. Okay, All right, so. <laughs> We're talking about you guys. Okay, so where are we? Let me just uh, we did that. Okay, Be gracious, 4 7. 
That's where we're supposed to stop. Right? That's where we've stopped right there. Yeah. Placing the four seven. <coughs> so we did all this. Okay. Placing four seven. All right. All right. So this is the next verse that he used. Galatians 4, 7. Oops. Okay. All right. Uh, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, so he's taking this idea, remember, so we're going back to this, so let's kind of refresh our memory of where we're at. Uh, so the idea here is whatever Christ has, we have. All right? Well, last week we kind of went through, I, I hope, pretty pretty in detail about how that's not true, right? How our glory is a different glory than Jesus, that he is returning to a glory, um, to a specific glory where we're gaining a different type of glory, how it's not the same type of glory, how ours comes solely through the work of Christ, and his is solely through his own work that he's done. So, um, so when we're talking about this, but he's still, so we're still going through each of these because that's what he's talking about. So we need to understand what all these words mean. Oops. And so the word heir just means an heir. So it is, so that's what that word means. So it's a good, like, straight, very few times you get these straight across words, right? That just are one word to, from Greek to English. But we have to understand what it means, like, what that word is. So it, the implication here is an allotted portion. Right? So if you're an heir to something, you're an heir to a specific amount of something. Right? It's not necessarily you're getting everything. So if you are in a family of two, you know, how much are you actually going to get? Right? At most, you're probably, you know, if, the, if your sibling wasn't a jerk, you're probably going to get half. Right? So you're not getting the whole you're getting an allotted portion. Wasn't so the Old Testament told that firstborn got everything? Not, not really. So he was first in line. So he gets the best. But the other kids are going to get something. Yeah, it's not just these. this guy and then have fun. It's this guy gets the best, the first stuff, and then everyone gets a portion. Yeah. So it's still this error idea. So yeah. So, but it's the same thing with, with ours. So Jesus is the first, you know, the first. He gets his first. And then we still get something, but we get an allotted portion. Mm -hmm. We're still, we're heirs, but we're still, we're not getting that. And that's why it's important to understand. He gets that, his glory. And then we do get a glory, but it's not the same glory, right? So, but in Galatians, in context, it says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Okay, so here's, a, here's this, how this even begins, right? So he's using seven, um, but even so we, what are we? We are in bondage, right? So right now, there's already a distinction between us and Christ. We were bondage. Christ was never in bondage. There's never anything in Scripture that tells of Christ being in bondage. So right then, there's a huge difference. He continues, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of the Son. So right there, you also see it. Okay, so Jesus is outside these things, right? He's outside the woman. He's outside under the law. But what does He do? He is made, right? He's made of a woman. So He comes into the world. He's made of the woman, so he's, he's the flesh, right? And then he's made under the law, right? So he's outside, and then he's brought into. And then you have, what, what's his purpose? To redeem them that were under the law. So us that were under the law, right? And that we might receive adoption. So he is the rightful heir. He is the rightful place. And we are gaining something that really shouldn't be ours, Right, because it's an adoption situation. We're being brought into um, a family, and so because you are sons, okay. Now, now it's talking about now that those things previous have happened. 
now we can talk about what do you gain as a son, right, in that position. But if you've already started in that position, it's a whole different story, right? So now we get what, what's coming next. So God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. So there's one thing we get, right? So we get this, the spirit. So that's one thing as adopted sons. Um, into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant. Okay, so you're a son, not a servant, right? And so this is all working on top of each other. This is why it's bad to have um, verses where you're just like, here's a verse that proves my point, right? Well, it might not actually prove the point because everything else leads into that verse. And so what were we before? We were children in bondage, okay? Okay. Then we were brought into the sonship. We were adopted in to something we don't deserve. And now we're no longer son, uh, servants but a son. And of a son, now you're an heir. Right? Now you get an allotted portion. But you did before. You had to be brought in first to get that allotted portion. Howbeit then, when we knew not God, we did service unto them which by nature are no God. So if he's saying... You worship idols. You worship false things when you're not sons, right? You would do this, this service, this worship to these things, okay? But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather are known of God, and that's a big difference there, right? Mm -hmm. So, to know of God is one thing, but to be known of God, right? Basically, he's saying that you are gods. Not, not gods, as in... <laughs> the deity part, but God, like, you are his. That's what I'm talking about. You are his. How turn ye again the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? So what, what's the purpose of this passage? You've been adopted. Why are you trying to go back to where you came from? Right. So this is, you've got out of that, right? So you're going to experience the goodness of God, why go back to it? Mm -hmm. So the emphasis, and this is the problem when we when we pick out verses, is a verse can, you know, a lot of verses can stand alone. But all verses stand together. And so this whole section is talking about being in bondage, being brought out of bondage into the family, not by our own works, but by Christ's. So why go back into bondage? Or do the things that would put you back into bondage, right? It's, yes, there's a, a point where it talks about you being a son, but it's talking about the, the focus is sin. You've come out of sin because of Christ. Why go back into sinful things? And so that's a huge thing to, to recognize in here. Because here are the implications. We were children of this world. Okay, we were in bondage. We were sinful. Okay? Jesus' work on our behalf brought us into adoption. So, so far I haven't done anything. Right? We serve gods that are not gods. And why would we return to such a life? And so this is the implication of the passage. The, the push is in the air. Though that is a part of that. Right? That's the adoption. What Some of the things that you get from adoption. But Specifically, what is he, what's the one thing that he tells us we do get from adoption in this passage? Yeah, we get the Spirit, right? So it actually tells us what's our allotment in this passage. It's the Spirit. The Spirit is our inheritance. That's what we get as heirs of God. Right? Right? And so that's another thing is the focus of the passage is this bondage into adoption. Why go back? Mm -hmm. But even if we just look at the error, we get the spirit. That is our allotment. Now there's more to it, but that's, a, that's what we're talking about in this one passage. Right? And this is why reading the whole book, in this case Galatians, in context would give us more understanding of 
what it means to be adopted as, as children of God. That's why it's important to read the New Testament. It's important to read the whole, the whole Bible, right? Because then we understand the heir, what it means to be an heir. But in this one passage, the focal point is you're in bondage, you became sons, why go back? What are you getting an heir? Why are you an heir? You're an heir. Your allotment is the spirit. And so this whole thing, that's really important stuff because it puts in what is. Because you can just say, okay, where we get, okay, what do we get, right, as heirs of Christ? Right, as sons of Christ. Okay, what do we get? Well, when you start reading in context, you start seeing what you get. Right? You get fruits of the Spirit. You get um, the Spirit itself. You get these things, and you never see deity. That's never something that you get. It never says, now you are God. You know? It's always these other things, these, these things that are... Uh, um, as Peter says, it's a taste, right? It's you partake in the divine. It's pieces of it. So eternity, just going into eternity is a part of the divine, right? Because God is eternal. Everything else isn't except what he deems to be eternal. And so when we, when we enter into eternity because of Christ, now we partake in the divine, because now this is something that's godly that we're being brought into. So, it's the same with the Spirit. We don't have the Spirit, and so when we are adopted in, now we have a piece, you know, a part in the divine. But that doesn't make us divine. You know? Okay. So, oops. Okay, so the next one he gives is Acts 17 and 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. Okay? So this offspring is what he's focusing on, right? And in Mormonism, the idea of us being spirit children, literally the offspring of the, the Elohim, Right? So that so he focuses in on that and says, okay, see, we are gods because it uses the word offspring. So like anything, whoops, like anything, we need to know what that word is. So the word means genos, okay, so it's the meaning of family, right? Or offspring. Okay, so that is a good translation there. Okay. So, okay. So now let's put it into context. So this is huge because not only do we need to know what's being said, but where it's being said, right? So if you're reading through, um, if you're reading through First Corinthians, and you're trying to figure out, you know, chapter eleven, and it's talking about women and um, being silent and all this stuff, and the and the gifts, right, from chapter 12 into chapter 14. It's talking about all these different things. Knowing who Paul is talking to and what's actually going on in Corinth really makes an impact of what he's saying. And so this is important because Paul isn't just talking here. Um, to He's not talking, to, first off, to Jews. That's a huge thing. He's talking to Greeks. He's talking to philosophers. That's a huge thing on the language he uses. And so when we start reading it, um, we have to keep that in mind. That he's not just talking to anyone. He's talking very specifically to these Greek philosophers. And so he starts talking. God that made the whole world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelt not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Okay, so we stop right there and we go, okay, what's Paul talking about, right? There's a distinction here between God and humanity. There's a huge distinction, right? So God makes all things. Okay? He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. 
right? And there was a lot of temples in Corinth. Yeah, and there's a lot of temples in Corinth. Um, and in Athens, so we're in Athens right now, but yeah, so Athens is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from Corinth. And so all throughout the Roman world, right, every, every town has at least um, a shrine or something, and then you get into these bigger cities, they have multiple things, and that's actually what he goes on to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Is these, all these different, or right before this, all these different um, statues and things, right? And so, but he's making this huge di difference between who God is, the creator of heaven and earth, and the Lord of earth and heaven, and humanity who's trying to gain favor with the divine, you know, through building temples and everything like that. And then he goes on, neither is he worshipped with men's hands. So again, there is a distinction between who humanity is and who God is. And he's in need, though he is, he needed any, as though he needed anything. You know, we talk about in um, in our basic Christian, basic faith of Christianity, um, we talk about what it means to be a a person that needs something and a, a being that needs something and a being that doesn't. I, I'm skipping on the word right now, um, but it's someone that yeah. So basically, everything is in need of something. Contingent. There we go. So a contingent being versus a non-contingent being. A contingent being needs something. We need air, we need food, we need water, we need sleep, we need, you know, all these different things we need. God needs nothing. And that's what we see here, is God is a non-contingent being. He needs nothing. Everything else in the universe is contingent on something else for life, except for God. And so we're seeing that here. And now we get into this. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Okay, so he makes humanity, right? This is a distinction. It would be very easy for Paul to talk about how we came from God, that we are divine beings like God is. It would be a simple task, for him, a simple thing for him to do right here, but he doesn't. Instead, he goes into God's creation, how he creates us. Um, dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times that are appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might fill after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So what, what are we supposed to do? We were supposed to seek after God. For in him we live and move and have our being. There's that contingency. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We rely on him. If we were divine beings, we, could, we didn't, wouldn't have to rely. Because God is not a dependent or a contingent being. Therefore, we shouldn't be contingent if we are divine. But we're not. And so then, what does he say? As certain also of your own poets have said. So Paul now is quoting. This is huge. <coughs> right? Because he's using this as, look, Paul's, you know, we are offspring. We are offspring of God. Well, what's that mean? <clears throat> well, first off, he's already told us what that means. That in him we need everything. For in him we live and move and have our being. We're from him. He creates us. That's how we are his offspring. So now when Paul says this, for as much, for so much, for as much, then as we are the offspring of God, for as much what? Based off that, right? Because of this, that God is not contingent, that God creates all things, that we are created by God, that we rely on Him, that, are, that we are now offspring of God. Right? And it doesn't say more. There's more there. There's a divineness there. But just because of that, now I can quote this guy that says we are offspring of God. It's not going any further. He's not giving us any more than that. He's just given us that. For as much then we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God is like unto gold or silver or stone engraven by art of man's device. How do we look at God? <coughs> well, if we look at the gods like the Romans did and the Greeks did, they were just like humans, right? They were horrible people. Yeah. You know, Zeus, um, 
you know, raped and enslaved, and he did all these things, you know, and and so all this stuff that's going on, that's what he's talking about. He's not like us, you know. He's not he's not like these these creatures that he created. And then it says, and the times of this ignorance God winked at. You know, God understands. He's saying, okay. Um, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To repent of these things. Right? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world of righteousness by that man whom he hath appointed. So now he's talking about, now he's going to change what he's talking about. Now he's going to go to the cross. Right? Um, wherefore, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. So now Paul's saying, okay, now, you know, God needs nothing from us. Right? We need everything from God. We're created by him. We're appointed to certain times. That's why I can say that he, we are offspring. Right? And so now that you understand that, now you're going to be judged. And how are you going to be judged? Through Christ. That's how you're going to be judged. So now he goes on to basically, here it is, that he hath raised them from the dead. There you go. There's, so you've got to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So this whole, this whole section, it, it, it's not talking about divinity. It's talking about where we're at. Mm -hmm. That God creates us. That we we are, like we talked about, contingent beings. Beings that need something to survive. We need God to survive. But he doesn't. He's the exact opposite. He's the non-contingent. He's the one that can do whatever he wants. He doesn't have what we, you know, the need that we have. I use that, you know, loosely. That he can do anything. Uh, he wants. But Paul's implication here is that God is not made, but we are. Well, I mean, the, the, he's alive as we are, so not like those different um, um, statues and things like you, you would have talked about earlier. And that he created us, and it is from him we have life. So that is one part of it. So he's implying, that's his implication, that God is not made like these other you know, Zeus or Ares or any of these other different gods. And then so, the, the full implication is create beings are in some sense God's progeny. Right? Because he created us. Okay? Um, but not that they are, one, sexually produced. There's nothing in that passage that has this idea. Um, this implication of the sons of God as related to um, angelic being. So, you know, that term is used of angels, too. Sons of God, that, that terminology um, related to angelic beings. So, what we can say here is that God has progeny, those that do righteousness. Right? They don't, they're not Him, so we wouldn't say angels are God. But He calls them sons because they act in righteousness. So, anytime someone acts in righteousness, God, you know, his righteousness, not just any type of right, but actual godly righteousness, God claims them. He says, you are mine, right? This is why David is a son of God. Not because David was a very, you know, was himself begotten by God, but rather because he lived in righteousness. He went after God. He asked for forgiveness, right? He sought in faith. And so... So this whole idea here has nothing to do with divinity. Nothing. It has everything to do with who God is and who we are. God is God. He is in need of nothing. He's alive. He's real. We are created by God. We are placed in certain areas by God. We are going to be judged by God. But if we turn to Him, then we will truly be His sons. We will truly be... So we're all offspring, but those who choose it will be actually be adopted. Yeah. Well, I just had a thought that in Revelation that new heaven and new earth come down and God will dwell with his people. <clears throat> but we need air and food and tree of life, and God doesn't need any of that. 
and yet he dwells with us. Well, so what will, what will our new bodies look like? Yeah. Right? And that, that's the thing is, so what will those things? Jesus can transport. Yeah. You know, so I think the physics are going to be very different. Yeah, like yeah. You, know, you won't need you won't need blood and air and food. Yeah, I don't, yeah. At that point, what what do you need? You know, it's everything sustained. Because that glorified body, it's not uh, uh, physical. Yeah, not in the the sense that we think. Yeah, because Jesus was physical, yeah. right? Because you could feel him. Yeah, you know, he could eat. Mm-hmm. But really, what you know, you know, what's that mean? No arthritis. No, no arthritis. <laughs> yes. That's for sure. Um, speaking of revelation, <laughs> um, so this is another one he, he gives. So, a revelation twenty one seven. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I think this is the the key one um, because when we start looking at this, we're going to see what all things actually means. But he says all things. So he's saying all things must mean divinity. It must mean that we become gods. Okay. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Okay. So, um, we're going to go kind of through all this, just to make sure, right? Shall inherit all things, okay? So it's will inherit all things, okay? So that's good. So what does inherit mean? Okay, it means to inherit. Okay, so we're still good. The reason why we do this is because being sure, because we've seen, right, in, in King James, that the words weren't like kings, right? We want to make sure that all the words are correct. So, but to understand what that inheritance means, it means an assigned inheritance. Remember we talked about what earlier, right? The allotment. And that's what we're, it's the same idea um, continuing through it. So it's to assign inheritance. So we will be assigned all things, okay? So we will inherit. Um, a certain assigned thing, okay, which means, okay, so all things, so, okay, so what is inherent means, it's an assignment, so what does all things mean, um, refers to a subject immediately perceived, right, so if we go back to the verse, he that overcomes shall inherit all things, or all these things, okay, that's the, that's the actual uh, implication here, it's the things that we're talking about. And so what is perceiving, right? And that's why, again, we need to read everything in context. So, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Hey, just brought this up. Um, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Okay, so you're already seeing that there is a, a relational thing here, right? Mm-hmm. God and people. So there, there is a distinction here, right? And God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this is a, a worshipful second, you know, so why, where is the Godness of humanity so far, right? Where is that? Because in Mormonism, they believe that you be a good enough Mormon, you can have your own planet. Okay, but there's nothing in this passage, at least, that talks about that. And this would actually be the passage that would, would talk about it, right? Because we're talking about the end. Okay, what is going to happen at that point? Right? All we're seeing is there's going to be people and there's going to be God. And it's going to be this very distinct relationship. And it says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Okay, so what are the former things? Right? Well, they're the opposite of what we just heard. Tears, right? Death, sorrow, crying, pain. Those are the those things are former because now they pass away and now what do we have? No death, no crime, right? Those are the new things. And so, and he sat upon the throne, 
He, he, so we're still, that's God, right? He sat upon the throne. Behold, I make all things new. So everything is made new now. And he said unto me, write for, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. What is done? Right? All that pain and sorrow, all that sin, all of that is the old universe, right? Is It's done. God has fully done, you know, fully conquered. And that's what we have. I am the Omega. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right? I will give unto them that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of, of the water of life freely. Okay, so what is he giving to us? The thirst for the water, right? He that overcomes shall inherit all things. What is the all things? Everything that was just talked about. Right? It's the no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. You know, it's none of that former things. It's all the new things that he's making. I make all things new. Okay? It's the thirst. It's the water of the, the, the life freely. And then what will we become? I, he says, I will be his God. Right? Going back to the beginning. And he shall be my son. So now it's an even more intimate relationship, but it's still this. It's still in the context of there be God and people. Right? It's just a closer <coughs> relationship than this far distant relationship. It's a close personal relationship. But the things that we are inheriting is not divinity. There's nothing in that passage that points us to us being gods. Instead, it's the new things that God is going to be creating. <coughs> it's, the, it's the no more pain, the no more sorrow, the no more death. You know, all that. It's the newness I, where he says, I make all things new. And so what do we, re, what do we inherit? All those things. Yeah. So we have no more pain or sorrow. <coughs> And God gave us his emotions of pain and sorrow, so does that mean he erases all that from because Jesus wept and was sorrowful and painful. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has no more sorrow, no more pain. Well what was there to be sorrowful over at that point? Right. So even if you had the emotion, you never you don't have to be there's sorrow. No more, so, yeah, yeah. There's no more. So you can still have the emotion and not have the sorrow. Right? Yeah. yeah before, so before the fall, it doesn't say that Adam you had pain or sorrow or anything like that. They were perfect. Yeah. But I mean, even then, so like pain, what is pain though? Like really, what is pain? Well, pain what? keeps you from, you know, if you step on a nail, you know. Right. Yeah, pain. Out. yeah pain isn't sinful. Right? You know, so. So they could have pain, but maybe not in the sense of like, this is destroying me. Or you pain know, of loss, um, love. Yeah, emotional. Yeah, yeah the, the emotional side of pain. You know, so when we start talking about what is like, like pre-fall, you know, like needing water isn't sinful, right? Needing food isn't sinful. Um, having, knowing, okay, I can feel that, therefore I need to cover it, right? That's not necessarily sinful, but maybe the result of sin, right? Now that's what, so now I, I feel maybe I stub my toe, you know, because of the fall. I don't know, I'm just <laughs> talking now. Um, and so that's not, that's not like biblical doctrine. Um, but you know, when we start thinking about, okay, what is prior to the fall, how did God make us so that when we fell, we would be able to deal with it? You know, or, you know. Right. It says that we will be higher than angels in the next life. And, like, there's an unseen war of angels going on, but we can kill somebody in a, in a battle war. But angels don't die, or do they die? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question, because I don't know. I don't know what 
Um, I, I know there's an eternalness to them. I mean, they're you know, the spirit, but what? How does that all work itself out? Um, you guys can point to the scripture. I mean, I don't. I see. I think the Bible doesn't give us too much on the spiritual realm. Right. Like, I mean, it could give us a lot more. Um, but I think we get just enough to be for God to say, okay, spiritual realm, rely on me. Don't seek after those things. You know, realize that there is a battle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it's not like here's a playbook of the enemy. <coughs> you know, so because I think so. C.S. Lewis had a good thought at the beginning of his um, his screw tape letters where he talks about you know there there's people that either fall too far into trying to figure out demons and there's people that fall too far into not caring enough. Mm. You know, really, we, we should take a biblical stance, which is, yes, they're out there. Yes, we need to understand there's a spiritual war. Yes, we need to be aware. At the same time, we really need, that should f make us go more into trusting God, you know, more in seeking Him, more in, okay, God, I know there's a spiritual war out here. I can't see it. So you got to leave me here, you know. Well, our finite minds can only understand so much, too. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, they get thrown into the lake of fire, mm -hmm. just like the human, yes. you know, so, you know, it's an internal punishment, so. But well, that's what goes on in Washington, I, I attribute a lot of that to the spiritual warfare going on there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it goes from from the little kid acting out against his parents to everywhere. There's no facet of the of reality that isn't at war, you know. So, yeah, um, it's just sometimes the horns come out even worse. Okay, so um, so what is the implication to this to this whole passage? Um, what is the all things? It's it's just being in the in the presence of God. I mean, it's it's the eternal life. Whatever Jesus is, you know, recreating, that's what we're getting. You know, he he's the one that's doing. It. Okay, so what all things? It's whatever he's giving us. That's the all things. It's not his divinity because there's that separation of God and and people. What it is is God's giving now. It's just a creation. All things, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying. These things are all passed away. Because that's the old world. That's what happens in, in sin. You know, you sorrow in sin. You, but now you don't need that. I mean, you know, it's all, all new. And so, so the implication here is that humanity will still be in the lower status of God, whom they worship, right? He is God, and we are people. Okay. That that's what it starts out with, right? Jesus is the was, is, and to come. He's the Alpha, the Omega, right? He is God. Humans will need God's permission to drink of the water, right? Who He's the one that will allow them, will give them the thirst, right? It's not that they get to take it. It's still God's still God. He is still the the controller, right? Um, and then finally, everlasting life with, with the presence of God is the inheritance. That's what we gain. There's nothing, nowhere do we actually see that we become divine. In none of these passages that he's given us so far. So, um, then we go back. So we went all the way to the end of Revelation, now we're coming back. Um, and it says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, um, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So here's a passage where he's saying, see, we get the throne. So that throne, right, that God sat down, so he's saying we get to sit down in that throne, okay? So that's how he's connecting these two passages. And so, what does throne mean? Okay, it means a seat of power, of dominion, okay? So that's what that idea is, okay? So this is really important because a throne... It's easy to think that a throne um, just has this idea of 
okay, a king, but a throne could be anything. A throne is, you know, it's a, a place of power. That's really the, the focal point here. It could be a kingly throne where a king and emperor sits. It could be a governor's throne, right? It's still a throne. Um, and the implication here is referred to the subject immediately preceding this. So the subject here is going back. And so, again, we need to go back into Revelation. So I know that works. Behold. Okay, so this is, in the context, it's one of those letters to a church, right? So he says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. And, ha and hast not denied my name. Okay, so this is encouraging words, right? Um, it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Okay, so now what's going on here? So there is a church that is facing opposition, right, against Jewish people. And Jesus is saying, No, they're a synagogue of Satan. They're not my people. Right? This is a, a blasphemous thing. Like these Jews are blasphemous. Um, he says, Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet. Now this is, we're going to get into this. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. Okay, so now he's saying, okay, so I'm going to put these people into a situation where they're going to come before you. And they use the word worship here. Okay? But what's the purpose? So they're going to come before you and worship before thy feet and know that I have loved you. So basically, this is a rejection thing, right? Mm -hmm. This one I love. This one I have rejected. This is a um, Esau Isaac situation, right? Esau Jacob. Esau. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> he and those guys mixed up. Isaac. Yeah. Israel. Okay. Yeah. Esau Jacob situation where one I love and one I have rejected. And so, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwelleth upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Okay, so going back to verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, right? Because you followed me, because you've done what I've told you to, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. So there's going to be a temptation, whether that be um, you know, however you want to interpret this, but for this church, it's this hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. So this is a big thing, right? Um, what is this temptation? You know, is it the apostate, you know, being apostates or what? Whatever it is, um, it's going to come everywhere. This, if you follow, you're going to keep, um, he's going to keep you from this hour of temptation. Um, to try them that dwelt upon the earth. So it's going to be a test, right? It's going to be um, a trial. Verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Right? So this is an encouragement part. Um, that no man take thy crown. Okay, so what you're going to be burning or what's going to be given to you. Verse 12, this is where, um, this is interesting. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, of, of my God. Okay, this is really important because what this has just shown us is there is a lot of um, analogy, a lot of um, uh, colorful language, right? It's it's to induce the imagination um, because you would actually have to take this as literal, right? Um, is God going to make you a pillar? in the temple. No, he's not going to make you a pillar, but the idea there is that you are going to be a building, you know, something that props up the temple of God, right? Uh, something strong, something that is there um, in the temple of God. And he shall go out no more, and I will write upon his name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, which is the New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. So what, it, so by going through this trial, Things are going to happen, and there's going to be a, um, uh, a working out. So these people are going to go into this situation. They're facing down the synagogue of Satan. These Jews have God's rejected. Um, and what is God going to do? He's going to bring them to worship before the, the, the synagogue of Satan, to worship before the thief. 
feet. He's going to show that he loves these this church. He is going to keep them from the hour of temptation. He's going to, if they hold fast. He's going to make them the pillar of God. Um, they're going to stand strong. He's going to put his name on them. He's going to put the city's name on them. You know, he's going. To, this is all of a, like a like a do. You're going to get a lot, right? A lot of things. God's really going to like do this great thing for you. And so, I think to me. So when we go, okay, where are we? Okay, when we come to this point, okay, this throne language, okay, to me this isn't as as hard as verse nine, the worship part, because to me that is more okay. We'll only worship for God, right? So if I was looking at this, I'd be like. Okay, that's where I would go to. If I was going to be like, we're all going to be gods. So you see, we're going to be worshipped, right? So to me, okay, yeah, so we need to know what that is. I think that that's a more important thing, okay? So I will cause them that will come and will worship before the feet. Okay, so that is the Greek literal translation. So as worship means, it means to do reverence to. Okay, so the word worship gets used, this word, okay, um, basically it's the prostrate, okay, um, cross, cross um, it just means to prostrate oneself to submit to another person. So you can prostrate yourself to submit to God, to idols, to kings, to princes, to governors. So it all is in the context. So, who alone can be worshipped? This is so. This is where you start putting all of Scripture together, right? Who alone can be worshipped? Only God. So if we go into the Old Testament, this is why. So they, so they say that John has four hundred and something verses, right? And two hundred and something verses. About half of the verses in John have something to do with the Old Testament. So when John is writing this, it's Old Testament. So let's go back to the Old Testament, right? What is, who gets worshipped in the Old Testament, right? All these different things can have this idea, but who is only supposed to be worshipped, right? It's God. So when this word is used, and it's talking about people, how are we to interpret that, right? So it's the same word. So the question is, okay, if God alone is supposed to be worshipped, how are we to interpret that word? Okay. So really, we have this, this whole implication of, um, so they're dealing with a synagogue, and they're going to be elevated, right? Because if we go back to, to the verse, what is actually happening here? Like, okay, so worship before your feet, so you know I love you, okay? Or know that, so they will know I love you, all right? So right there, what's happening? What's the, you have the synagogue of Satan and the distinction, right? This is one that gets rejected. This is one that gets accepted, okay? This one that gets accepted, they're going to, they're going to escape the hour of temptation, right? But what about the synagogue of Satan? This temptation is going to come upon the whole world in verse 10, right? So this is also going to be upon this synagogue of Satan. It has to be, because it's on the whole world. It's not on these that love are being loved. And so right now you have this distinction. Okay, so they're going to hold fast. They will overcome. Okay, they have a crown. Okay, they will be made a pillar. Right? They're going to get God's name. They're going to get the name of the city of God. Right? And I will write my new name on them. So this is a total separation. Right? From worldliness, from the sinfulness, from the synagogue of sin uh, situation. And so... When you come when you come to this worship, okay, so it's 
it's really this this reverence. They're going to be placed over these people, right? They're going to have to, the synagogue of Satan is going to come before them. And we see this type of ideas with judgment and how, um, so Bob brought up how humanity will be brought higher than the angels. Like that idea is because we're going to judge angels. So this whole idea of a reverent position, right, of judgment, of looking at people, of, of speaking um, judgment is actually throughout Scripture. And so this isn't a worship situation. Mm -hmm. This is a, a judgment situation. So you're going through this time, and you're having this um, situation, and God's saying, I'm going to place you in a position, you know, at some point where these people are going to have to come before you, and they're going to have to pay respect. They're going to have to, they're going to get judged. And so you're going to be there in that position. Now, how that's going to look, you know, and if this is specifically to this one church, or is it, you know, to the church universal, or is it, you know, this, these different ideas. And so, but, this is just going through all these different things. What is a pillar? Okay, it means to hold it up. So the person, the implication here is to uphold the work of God. You know, the, the reverence, the worship of God. And so, it's, it's really, when we start looking at, so, if we're going to be the, the ones who are worshipped, why are we just a pillar in God's temple? Right? Why aren't we on the mercy seat? Why aren't we the mercy seat? Why aren't we in the holies of holies? Well, because we're not the worshipped, right? We're not, we're the ones that just people respect. So we're upholding the work of God. We're, we're there. And so when you start going through all this, what is happening? Okay? So all this, and then you get to the throne. Right? What is Jesus' throne? It is a, a throne of um, of command, right? It's a throne of um, judgment. So what what are we? We're doing the exact same thing. In a certain situation, right? In this certain situation. Um, so this is why so I have and this is like a side note, okay? Um, this is why personally I have a problem with um, going through Revelation saying everything's about us, right? In there. Uh, rather, there might just be this one church in this one situation. This one church is going to have a special place to where they will be judges of this certain situation or this certain thing. Now, we might in our lives be a judge of a certain situation, you know, that God has given us. Um, but rather, but you know, it's hard to me. I'd rather go to that first than to say, okay, everything's about everything, and then we got to figure out where we're going to be put in. You know, start with that. So just this understanding that through this whole thing, it's really positional of what we're doing. <coughs> These people are going to be overcomers, okay. So what are they getting? They're getting a place that shows that they're an overcomer, right? They're a pillar. They're standing. You know, we use the same we use the same type of language. They're a pillar in the community, right? Why? Because they they done great things. They they love the you know the community. They um, you know given to the local charities, and they're just a strong person in the community. And so we kind of see the same idea here, that here's a church, strong in their faith, God is going to give them a position that is worthy of that, that overcoming that they've done. And so, and he's going to give them that reverent position. <coughs> All right. Um, let's do, I think we can do one more. Since I started a little bit late. Okay. Um, okay. All right. This is a big one, 2 Peter 1 4. Um, there, whereby are given unto us exceeding great joy, exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so he's saying, okay, we are partakers of the divine nature. Again, this is another one of those things he's saying we're going to be divine. Okay, so what does partakers mean? It means a sharer, a partner, a companion in. All right, so this actually goes with what we've already been talking about, right? What's an inheritor? What's inheritance? It's a portion of something, right? And that's the same thing we see here. It's a partaker. So what's the divine? Okay, that is um, the theos, the divine, okay? And nature, what's that mean? Okay, it means nature, okay? So this is, so we're partaking, we're sharing, we're a partner in, we're a companion of the divine, Okay, the godness, the godhood, okay, um, his nature, okay, the divine nature, okay. Now it's interesting, it just doesn't say, he doesn't say this, that by these you might be partakers of the divine. You know, he adds an extra word in it, divine nature. So why would he add that word in. Why, if, he, if he meant the divine, why not just the divine? We are partakers of the divine. That he adds in there that extra word. So, implication. Okay, did I? Yeah, okay, good. So the implication of that is uh, humans being in the presence of God in eternal fellowship. Right? It's the nature of God. We're, we're experiencing His goodness and all that, right? Um, but we need to look at this in, in context, right? So Simon, a servant. Okay, so already right there. Simon Peter, a servant. That's how he starts off this, this letter. That's really important. Because how does Peter view himself in the context of what he's going to be talking about? Mm -hmm. He views himself first as a servant, and then an apostle of Christ Jesus. So already we are we can see what how Peter's already when we get to that partakers part, we can already see where Peter is starting. He's already the servant, right? Um, apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. And our Savior Jesus Christ. So he's talking to other Christians, he's, you know, right? The other partakers. Um, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our and of Jesus our Lord. So he wants grace and peace to be expanded, right? And how is it expanded? It's through the knowledge of God and Jesus, right? Of the Father and of the Son. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So what are the all things for him that he's talking about? It's the, it's all the things that pertain to unto life and godliness, right? So according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So everything that pertains to those things, God has given us, right? All things, okay? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Okay? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Okay, so there it is. So, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Okay, so what are the promises? Right? <coughs> that by these, that these precious promises that by these might be partakers of divine nature. So, by the promises, right, now we can partake. What are those promises? Okay, well, it's all things pertaining unto life and godliness. It's all following each other. Okay, and, uh, so this is a comma, right? So, partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so he's saying, so there's a, a distinction here. The divine nature, right? The being a partaker in it, the preciousness, the the life and godliness. It's an escape. It's it's separate from the the world of lust, right? And and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, 
to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they may they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. What is one word that he keeps bringing up through this whole thing? It's knowledge. Yeah, he keeps bringing up this knowledge, right? He starts it out up here through the knowledge of God. Drop down through the knowledge of Him, right? And to knowledge, right? Or um, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, right? And then he comes all the way down and says, and that may neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge believer. So, what is, what does it mean to be a partaker of the divine nature? It's to have the knowledge of Christ, right? And what is that knowledge? It's, it's having faith, right? Virtue, diligence, um, temperance, right? Patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. This is the divine nature. This is what we're supposed to be partakers in. So that we're not there. We're not unfruitful. This, how do we get that? Is this emphasis on knowledge strictly in the knowledge of God and the Spirit and rule out the scientific worldly knowledge or does it include that so that we can find God through? I think what this is, so when we come back up to the beginning, grace and peace multiply to you, uh, unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, um, and Jesus our Lord. I think what we're talking about <laughs> is specifically the, the faith. So when he starts out, to them that have obtained this like precious faith, us uh, with us to the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, I think that's what we're talking about, is the knowledge of salvation. Yeah. So I think we're specifically talking about that in this context. And because of this knowledge, now you can gain all these other things. You can have them partaking of the of the divine nature. And what is that divine nature? He gives us a list of things that are godly here, that are, you know, that come from God, the virtue, the temperance, the brotherly kindness, and uh, everything that goes up into that. And so, that's why reading in context, the, what it means to be partakers of divine nature. Okay, it means escaping from corruption of the world. It means um, giving all diligence, uh, adding to faith virtue, and all those following characteristics. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about this whole divine nature. So we're not talking about divinity, right? Because he could just kept that out, that nature part out, and just said, you know, we're partakers of the divine. But no, he says the divine nature, and then he starts going in and just starts listing things. Here's all these different things. Um, so we come to this. What does it mean by our takers and the divine nature? It's really to have the, those fruits of the Spirit, right? That's what it is. Um, um, to be manifest in us, to be holy as God is holy, right? It's not to be divine as God is divine. It's to be set apart. It's to be unlike the world. It's to have, you know, the, the things, the literally the WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? It's literally that. It's God living through us to accomplish what he wants. You know, so it has nothing to do with I become divine. It has everything to do with I become, you know, what God always intended, which was be just like Him and how He does things. And so, all right. So next week we'll get into Psalm 82, which this is this is I think every time I've had a conversation with um, Mormon and they bring up theosis, it's always Psalm 82. It's always John. Like those are the two that I've always heard. Um, it actually wasn't until this guy that I heard all these different ones because it was it was like the standard. No, it's 82. It's John, um, and so so yeah. So we'll get into that next week. Oh no, we won't. Okay. What is next week? Um, I think we will be right next week. Okay, 15. Yes. So we will be here the 15th, so 8th and 15th, yes, so we'll be here next week. 
So we'll get into this section uh, next week. And so, all right, and there are only 80 more slides to go, so. Mm -hmm. Briefly. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Only 80? Only 80. <laughs> so, oh, wait, no. 40, 40, only 40. Sorry, I can't subtract. 60 from 20. <laughs> I added them instead of subtracting them. I'm sorry. So only only 40 left. Right? So any, any closing thoughts, comments before we head out? My only thought is we have a friend back home who's Mormon. And we've been praying, God, how do we reach him, what do we do? And so this is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, this is only like one little bit, sliver. But yeah. still, yeah. it's like helpful to be getting something. My my prayer every time we do this is that whenever you read so um, Janet did this to me on Sunday so I was doing prophecy and because we're not going through like um, like a, pro a prophetic book and just going okay here's all the prophecy here's all how it connects we're going okay here's the Christmas story here's all the prophecy in these three sections and we're only covering these three sections we're not even talking about everything and I'm like so here's a verse here's um, the prophecy here's the fulfillment right and she goes it kept coming to my mind like I need to go back and read all these in context because that's what you've been telling us I said exactly so you have to read all these in context and see how it become, how it's a prophecy and then you have to read the fulfillment and see how it's a fulfillment and there's a lot of work to do as a believer when um, you actually do what God calls you to do, which is test the spirits, right? So it's even the pastors. So you got to make sure. That's what I'm finding is listening to this. This is not just important. It has the implication of if you're talking to a Mormon, but there's a greater implication just talking to somebody. Uh, I like. I've heard the phrase used: a hopeful agnostic, mm -hmm. that you can help steer them. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and I've had people say, you know, the Bible says this. You know, it's like, okay, well, let's look. Because I know what you're talking about. Okay, so let's find it. All right, so let's look what it says. And, um, you know, every time it's, well, there's more to it. Uh, so with a progressive Christian, um, God is love, that's it. Mm -hmm. There's no condemnation, no nothing, right? It's like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Okay, let's read John 17. Let's read John 18. There is condemnation, but we do it onto ourselves. God seeks for us to be not condemned, but... We're in condemnation, like without Christ, and so, so yeah. So it, this isn't just this is how you deal with Mormons. This is anyone that wants to approach Scripture. It's always let's read in context mm -hmm. and see what God actually says, because there's freeing stuff there. You know, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. You know, <clears throat> and so yeah, I'm using, working with a, a brother-in-law who keeps saying, well, it's just like the Greek and Roman God. God was invented to explain that which we could not explain as the Greek and Romans would. And I keep trying to convince him that the Greek and Romans were a god of the gaps. Yeah. Ours isn't. Mm -hmm. And he has a hard time conceiving of anything non-physical. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I, I need to keep... That's why I have a question about knowledge. Yeah. Because I can bring him through science as realization that science will lead you to find God. Yeah. This is not just a physical yeah, thing. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, what I would suggest is go with them to... Um, so you know that question, who created God? You know, it's, it's like a philosophy one. <coughs> yeah. It's childish. Um, it's really like, okay, let's talk about the universe, right? Okay. Um, just our planet like people don't understand how how perfect our planet is right mm -hmm. you know, like you know the we're so in the arms of the Milky Way we are in exactly the right place and closer we'd be collapsed by a mm -hmm. you know, black hole and further we'd be flying out you know mm -hmm. um, and then our solar system is perfect earth is perfect from the Sun 
we have the Magic. belt. Yeah, we have all these different things. We have Jupiter. We can't survive without Jupiter. Right, right. You know, all these different things. And then, okay, so if you have this perfect setup, right, um, this is why scientists go, it has to be a matrix type thing, right? That we have to be, I just have, I just, um, a couple of weeks ago, I found an article where they're saying that we have, our universe has to be a petri dish. Like it has to be someone working it out. You know, these are scientists because mm -hmm. they can't have God, so it has to be in a laboratory. Right. Um, but then you start going, um, okay, well, who, when we talk about God, what are we talking about, right? He's timeless, spaceless, um, I forget all the different things, but he's timeless, spaceless, um, because you need that in order to create the universe. He you know? exists outside of our physical realm. Right. Yeah, and it's, so it's the, it's the truth, and you know, really, secular science, the problem with it is they start out with an assumption that they accept by faith. Mm -hmm. um, their assumption is that all of this came from nothing. Mm -hmm. That's an assumption, and they take that by faith. Our assumption is really? that <laughs> there was a creator, because everything that we see in the creation, whether it be a building or whatever, had a point of creation, so it points to create a creator. Everything we've created physically in the world had a creator, had a designer, right? And it ha that had to, that had to come about. And I, I I love the title of the book out there. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Yeah. 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 But they are accepting <coughs> that it's something that's incredibly hard to believe right. compared to. And this and atheist. this is where somebody like John Lennox. Who's a, who's a mathematician is proving God through science and mathematics. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. The problem is accountability. You know, um, they don't want to be John Rennick, so is he an old earth scientist? I don't know. I, I've never heard him speak on it. No, I have I not. Heard him, I have not I either. I heard him talking here a while back, and I'm sure he's an old earth scientist. Uh, he's trying to encapsulate. Atheist into. I don't know. I don't know if it's the same I, guy. This I've, is I've a, watched so many of them. I just forget. Yeah, he's a um, he's a Scottish guy. Scottish. Uh, yes. He's Scottish. Um, he's, he's actually, I think Irish, but oh, Irish. Yeah, they're all the same. <laughs> very Don't tell people in Scotland or Irish. Uh, but um, but there are several out there that um, yeah. So there's a there's a guy he's uh, from used to work for NASA I don't know if he still does um, but he was challenged by an atheist to look at uh, as a from a Christian to look at the what they were seeing right and now he does a whole like thing on the universe and how um, and he goes into things like there's a moon of, of Jupiter that is almost completely smooth mm -hmm. and. It shouldn't be, it should be like ours. According to Wikipedia, Whoops. John Carson Lennox is a Northern <laughs> Irish mathematician. Oh, it is ours. <laughs> yeah. so. He's really interesting to listen to his debates. And before, what was his name? The, the one of the two famous atheists? The one who died fairly. Yeah. Oh, he's a seven-day guy. <clears throat> they, tried to pull, they tried to pull him into faith so hard, but he still died. Yeah. Well, his brother, Hitchens, his brother, yeah. is a believer, and yeah, it was to hear him talk about his brother's death was really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, if you want the current leader of the atheists, is the mm -hmm. guy who wrote uh, the God Delusion. Dalton, yeah. what's his name? Yeah, but you know, atheists like uh, uh, philo philosophy atheists, they hate them. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you oh. just can't stand them. The, the, the <clears throat> counter to that is The Devil's Delusion by Belinsky. Yeah. And Belinsky's an agnostic. Yeah. Well, there, it's really interesting when you start listening to atheist philosophers, like <clears throat> really high ones, because they're like, um, yeah, that's possible. Like, they're, the God is possible. You know, I would just reject them. You know, it's like, it's pride. Yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah. 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 
you know, there's a lot of hurt, like a lot of atheists I run into. It's not so much they have a problem with God, it's what has happened to them. Mm-hmm. And so they have to get down past down. that hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What it boils down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah. it's not God's not the problem, like the idea of God. <coughs> it's God did this to me. And therefore I reject him because he rejected me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I felt so bad for, what's his name, Stephen uh, Hopkins? Hopkins. Oh, Stephen Hopkins. Yeah, yeah, he allowed at one time, oh, there may be a God. Yeah. But then he finally said, no, it's all gravity. That man was crippled his nearly his whole life. Mm-hmm. He went into a step <clears throat> rejecting the glory of God. He could have this wonderful body now. But he rejected it. And that was close to his death, wasn't it? That he yeah. turned like that. The water. interesting part is he's yeah. the one proponents of the Big Bang theory. Mm-hmm. Right before he died, said, I now know there's something beyond the Big Bang. He didn't call it God. <laughs> he just says there's something beyond it. The last I read was it was all gravity. Yeah. But it would be nice to think that at that last minute, he came to faith. Yeah. Always pray for that. With deep on the cross, right? Yeah. But anyone who really gets into studying science, how can they deny? I mean, it's just because they don't want to be accountable. Yeah, it's accountable. They don't want to yeah. be accountable. Well, I, I, I know a lot of science, scientists who would be accountable and who have used their science to discover God. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, and that's the thing is how, how many, like, um, they did a, how was it called? A, you know, a survey of different philosophers and they said that like ninety percent of all philosophers or something like that reject God. And so uh, William Lent Craig, he was he was talking about it and he goes, you know, I, I started asking my philosopher friends at all these different institutions across the nation, did you get a call? They said, No, they never called me. And these are like top philosophers. Mm-hmm. That's and the problem with and with surveys and statistics. Yeah. Yeah, so yep. how many are actually out there? It's like Elijah complaining that he's the only one. Mm-hmm. And God's like, I got 5,000, yeah. you know, out yeah. there. So don't mm-hmm. worry about it, you know. So that was the opposite of that being of a atheist being the Pope thinking that he's God on earth. Well, there's a lot of people that are like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also the prophet, the prophet of the yeah. Yeah. right. Where are we going? Other Mormons. What's that? Where are we going today? His word, his word is above the Bible. Yeah. Where are we going today? Well, every, every, every cult does it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Over lunch, we went for every cult. I just don't, oh, even if I didn't no, feel this didn't. deep, you know, the God no, hole or whatever, I, 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 love I would be terrified if I, I crossed God so and so <laughs> I mean, I would, I stand in awe of it. I, I love when he loves me, but I still stand in awe. Well, that, yeah, that's the thing. Clean light. That's right. Even read the Marine King. All right, well, let's pray, and then we'll be done for the evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time that we have to spend together. Uh, Father, I pray for those that are out there um, that are struggling, that are hurting, that they just reject you for whatever reason. Uh, Lord, I pray that um, we could be people that could... Be loving, be gracious, but be truthful and being honest and pointing them back to you and to really standing firm for, for the faith. Lord, let us be like that, those, that church um, that you said you want uh, to keep the crown, uh, give them a place of authority. Lord, use us. Use us to be able to stand firm for you um, and be able to give a reason why we're doing it, not just that we're doing it because we're right, but we're doing it because of you, you're right, that you have done so much for us. Let us be in awe of you and be broken hearted for the people that are they're on their way to to the lake of fire. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to be moved by your Holy Spirit to do the work that you would call us to do. Uh, Lord, I pray for everyone here. And that they would get home, that they would uh, stay healthy, and um, during this um, winter season, and that we would be prepared for any time that you would call us into ministry. So Lord, we thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.